Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Paleocrat Diaries on the Meaning of Catholic. I'll be your host this evening, this morning, this afternoon, whenever you're watching this. This is the Ecumenical Councils, and I'm Jake Fowler. And I'm rocking a, no- a-, a lovely, lovely drink here. It's called a Contramundum in honor of St. Athanasius. It's bourbon, it's lime juice, it's grenadine, a little lime wedge on top. It's very tasty. It's chilled. It makes me feel good. It makes me want to celebrate St. Athanasius. Today's my kid's birthday, too. We named him Benedict Athanasius after this great saint. So, another reason to celebrate. Man, things are good. Things are going really well. I'm glad we're back. Here we are. This is part 13. If you're coming in and you haven't seen anything up to this point, I want you to stay for sure. Get a feel for how we do things here. I walk us through the ecumenical councils. We're in about the year 640, 641, somewhere in there. We're coming up on the sixth council, but we've already been through Nicaea, Constantinople I, Ephesus, Chalcedon, and Constantinople II. And so after you're finished today, I would invite you to check out my playlist on the meaning of Catholic. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah set me up a playlist on his channel on Paleocrat as well. You can check it out there uh, in addition. Okay, before I turn down the music, I just want to remind everybody to like, share, subscribe, comment, do all of the things. It really does help. It helps our analytics, boosts our numbers, get our, gets our videos in front of more people. And so we can have a greater impact. That's part of the goal here is to reach a broader and broader audience to bring the truth of the Catholic faith to more and more folks. All right, here we go. Down with the music. Pleasant though it is. Okay. So, I left you last time, and we, we were discussing the final days of the Emperor Heraclius. He was a Roman African. He was actually from the East, but he lived in Roman Africa. He was a very able general. His father had set him up with an army. He marched on Constantinople, and he took the throne from who was previously emperor, Phocas, who was himself a usurper. So Heraclius comes in, and he's, like I said, very capable military commander. He wins a number of notable battles against the Persians. He reclaims the Holy Cross, and he lives out his days, over 30 years of imperial reigning in relative security. When he died in February of 641, his son, Constantine III, ascended the throne, but he was sickly and he was dead by May. However, before Constantine III died, he confirmed to Pope John IV that he would, in fact, remove the declaration that Sergius of Constantinople had put into effect. I'm referring to the ecthesis. This is that document that Sergius, who was the patriarch, had written up, and this was an agreement between he and the former Pope Honorius to cease discussions on whether there was one will or two wills in the person of Christ. But Sergius says, by the way, there's just one will, but we're not going to talk about it. John IV was exceedingly angered by this document. And before Heraclius died, the Pope had convinced him to retract it. Undo the damage you've done, your highness. His son, Constantine III, confirms this to good Pope John IV, But, like I said, he only lasted, what, three months, maybe a little less? The new emperor, who's just a boy, Constans II, he was 11 years old, he wanted to promote the ecthesis of Sergius and uphold Chalcedon. So he wants to say that Christ just has one will, but that he still has two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. This was the great achievement, the development of doctrine that occurred in the mid-5th century, in 451 to be precise. 
Now, naturally, an 11-year-old is not going to think of this. These were the ideas of his advisors. The Pope rejected this, and he wondered aloud, uh, that is to say, he wrote an angry letter, wondering why is the policy of the great emperor Heraclius and his son Constantine III not being followed? And the Pope at this time is not John IV, but a man named Theodore. In this same year, 641, Pyrrhus, who's the patriarch of Constantinople, was deposed by Constans, Constans II, the new emperor, probably for some illegitimate political reasons. A new patriarch is installed. This man's name is Paul. And Pyrrhus, for his part, is summoned to Rome. You see, he was one of the bishops who signed on to the ecthesis of Sergius of Constantinople. This was prior to Sergius's death, obviously, and Pyrrhus's elevation to the patriarchate. Well, Theodore wants to have a little chat with Pyrrhus. He says, you know, that thing you signed, it's kind of like a little bit of heresy, maybe. One will in Christ, you know, we don't do that here. So I'm going to need you to go ahead and come to Rome, okay? And we're going to have to discuss this. Pyrrhus doesn't want to go. He delays. He doesn't want to confront Theodore. So he goes to the place where he thinks the Pope won't be able to get him. He goes to Africa. However, in Africa, he met quite a formidable foe. I'm referring to St. Maximus the Confessor. Before I continue with St. Maximus, I have got to say something about the rise of Islam. We've now 20-something years past the supposed revelations that Muhammad received. In 622, Muhammad, an Arab, uh, a, a pagan-ish, Christian-ish kind of guy, right? Tribal religion mostly. He believed, and he claimed later, to have received visions from the angel Gabriel. Now, Catholics know that public revelation is closed since the death of the last apostle. So if this was anything... It was a private revelation. Now, there's really good reason to think that it wasn't private revelation from Gabriel or from God. I'm not going to get into those reasons. If you're that curious, do some internet searching, and I'm sure you'll find plenty of things to read. Nonetheless, Muhammad, he took these visions to be true revelations. And they were later written down with the aid of scholars notably uh, Catholic scholars, or at least, at the very least, people who were familiar with Catholic theology. This is what later became known as the Quran. Muhammad begins to gather some followers. He says, look, God spoke to me. He, 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 he spoke to me. He, he told me all kinds of stuff. And he really wants you guys to do what I say. And he wants other people to do what we all say. So sharpen your swords, boys, because uh, we've got to bring the message to the whole world. So he gathers these followers. He convinces them that he is the prophet. And they do what any prophet normally does, is they start making war on their neighboring tribes. Long story short, and admittedly light on detail, this is not my purpose here. I, I, I don't really care that much about Arab history. But the now Muslim Arabs begin their long and devastating march across North Africa and all throughout the Middle East. Here's some of their notable victories. All right, so recall, Muhammad's uh, so-called revelations occur in 622. A mere 12 years later, he's taken the city of Damascus. That's in 634. In 637, Jerusalem, 638, Antioch, 639, Palestinian Caesarea, 641, Babylon, 642, Alexandria, 
And by 651, nine more years, the Arabs are at the doorstep of India. They're on the Indian frontier. They're spreading to the east. They're spreading to the west. Most of the territory that they gained back then has been held ever since. A couple ebbs and flows here and there. But in general, beginning in the first half of the 7th century, right? 630s is when the, the war starts. The Muslims have taken territory and have held on. And that's why they're still a force today, right? And I don't mean to say that Muslims are violent. I'm simply pointing out the history of the matter. Okay, back to St. Maximus, the confessor. He was born to a noble family in Byzantium in the year 580. His family was actually very close with the emperor Heraclius, or, or the family of the emperor Heraclius. And Maximus himself served as a clerk in the court of Heraclius while the former uh, was still alive. His monastic experience is a bit of an odd one. He didn't stay in one monastery. He sort of wandered around. Uh, so the sources that I was reading says he went from Sisychus to Carthage. So from east to west, he was fleeing the Persians. Uh, this would be under the reign of Heraclius when the Persians are just tearing through town. You know, they're, they're taking up territory left and right. Prior, obviously, to Heraclius's notable victories against them. Well, Maximus ends up in Roman Africa, right? So consider um, not Egypt, but a little further west, sort of maybe just south of Italy, the, that central northern portion of the continent. Maximus was an extremely learned man. Well, he was one of the most brilliant men to ever live, uh, and he stands out amongst his peers. He was one of these displaced Greeks, right? So a lot of settlement occurred because of the wars and the conflict, not only with the Persians, but now with the Arabs. Easterners move to the West. They don't ditch their Eastern customs and their Eastern learning. They just live in the West now. And this is, Maximus is one of these guys. He brings Byzantine theology to Africa, to Sicily, and eventually to mainland Italy. According to uh, Father John Meyendorf, a very well-read scholar, notable, he says, quote, It is impossible to understand the whole of Byzantine theology without becoming aware of Maximus's synthesis. So what Father Meyendorf means is that you can't get a picture of Eastern theology that doesn't include St. Maximus. We could make the same argument for any of the church fathers, really, but in a particular way, the brilliance of St. Maximus really shines through in the seventh century because he is the brain behind the quest for orthodoxy surrounding the question of one or two wills in the person of Christ. So what is this synthesis? For Maximus, the question of one operation or one will in Christ versus two operations or two wills in Christ is solved by looking at natures. Now, we know from the Council of Chalcedon and from apostolic tradition that Christ has two natures. He has a divine nature and a human nature. And so what are these Natures. Well, these natures are a really existing thing that make themselves known to the rest of the existing things in the world through their action, right? So the, the adage, uh, egere sequitur esse, comes to mind. That's action follows being, meaning if something is, it's going to act on the things around it. Even something like a rock, 
What does a rock do to the things around it? Well, it occupies space. It presents itself with a certain size, shape, color, texture, and so on and so on. So a rock is obviously an inanimate object. So it itself isn't doing any actions the way an animal or a human would. But that's not exactly the kind of action we're speaking about here. We're talking about something's being manifesting itself in the way it is, right? And if you can point to the way something is and identify this is these are the acts of the thing, then you have an indication of what that thing is. Well, we can do the same thing in reverse. If we know that something exists, well, then we can logically conclude that it must act. It must have its own proper acts. And this is what Maximus did. He says, I know that Christ has two natures. He has a divine nature and he has a human nature. Well, if that's the case, if there are two truly existing things, then they both must have proper actions, proper operations. Hence, two operations in Christ, two wills in Christ. A human action is done by human willing. Christ couldn't have been without it. He must have two wills. We know he's got a divine will because he shares in the Godhead. And now we're certain that he has a human will because we're certain that he has a human nature. But there arises a problem. How could we say that there are two wills in Christ without running into the issue that from time to time they might be opposed to one another? Because we all know that the divine will and our human wills aren't always on the same page, right? The fault is ours, clearly. Nonetheless, there's a bit of a gap there that develops, okay? And for some of us, it, it kind of lingers. Maximus explains that Christ had what he calls a natural will, and he wants to distinguish this from what he calls a gnomic will. That's G-N-O-M-I-C. It's the anglicized adjectival version of a Greek word, which means inclination or intention, something like that. Maximus identifies our human wills as gnomic wills because they're inclined to sin. We, we have a will that we've inherited. Our human nature comes down to us post-original sin. We don't have the pristine state of existence that Adam had prior to the fall. But Christ does. Christ is perfect man and perfect God. His will, his being, is untainted by sin of any kind. And so his will is a natural will, not subject to the wiles of temptation and concupiscence, least of all sin. We know that from Hebrews 4.15. He's like us in all things except sin. And so... If Christ has this natural will, that means it always chooses the highest good without hesitation, since it's not encumbered by the stains of sin that we experience. A gnomic will, on the other hand, the kind we have, is affected by temptation. We, we do have hangovers from the fall. We do have concupiscence. Gnomic wills, like ours, do not always choose the highest good without hesitation. We don't always choose the highest good, period. We're not perfect in our freedom. If you were perfect in freedom, you would always choose the best thing. And what's the best thing? Well, God and the virtues. But we're not perfect in freedom. So therefore, attention exists within us and this manifests itself with our relationship with the Godhead 
And so that was this gap that I was speaking about just a few moments ago. It seems like our wills are in opposition. It's because they are. But that's our will. That's not Christ's will. Now, someone could object. Well, if his will isn't like ours, then how are ours redeemed? It's a, it's a pretty good objection, I think. And the answer is that Christ still has a true human will. And that his natural will, which offers himself con in conjunction with the divine will on the cross for our sins, this is what restores our nature. He brings us back up, opens up the possibility to bring us back to where we were. Okay, We're going to suffer. We're going to fall from time to time, inevitably, it seems anyways. And yet, so long as we repent, so long as we strive day in and day out, God willing, we can enjoy the beatific vision. Our wills can be perfected. They can become natural wills once more, perfect in their freedom, that choose always the highest good with no hesitation. That's heaven, my friends. That is heaven. We know Christ was sinless. Therefore, again, as I've said, he had a natural will, and it was always in harmony with his divine will. This is the great synthesis that Maximus worked out and bequeathed to the church. We owe him so much, so much. It's a beautiful explanation of Christology. It maintains the Father's principle uh, that that which was not assumed was not redeemed, and it solves the problem facing the church at this time in the mid-7th century, the monothelite heresy, that Christ only had one will or one operation. Maximus says, no, 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 no. You've got it all wrong. It's two. And he's got the arguments to back it up, right? And he's got scripture and tradition on his side too. So it's like, you know, pretty much a done deal. Okay, so Maximus is living in, in Roman Africa. And Pyrrhus, the now deposed patriarch of Constantinople, was fleeing from having to meet with Pope Theodore. And he goes to Africa. And what do you know? He runs into St. Maximus. Pyrrhus was apparently swayed by Max, Maximus's theology. But there may be more to the story. There always is. There was, you see, in Africa at this time, a certain general. His name was Gregory. Gregory was the imperial exarch. Uh, and that's sort of uh, like a governor of sorts, like a regional governor, right? Pretty powerful um, not an emperor. He wasn't like a Caesar of the West or something like that. He, he's definitely uh, working for the emperor, Constans II. But he enjoys a lot of power. He enjoys the support of, of his army that he has there, right? And Gregory happens to be orthodox. Oh, and by the way, Gregory happens to be planning to take an army to Constantinople and overthrow Constans II and make himself emperor. Pyrrhus, the displaced patriarch, he finds all this out. And he thinks, you know, there's a chance this might work because, after all, that's exactly the same thing Heraclius did just like 35 years ago. So it's not out of the question that a general from Africa can march to Constantinople, depose the emperor, and set himself up and have a very long and successful reign. Maybe I need to throw my lot behind this Gregory. But Gregory's orthodox. And Pyrrhus, at least on paper, is a heretic. He signed the ecthesis of Sergius of Constantinople, the monothelite document that says Christ only has one will, one operation. Well, Pyrrhus is cunning. He's very clever. And he arranges a public debate 
or it, maybe he doesn't arrange it, but he participates in this public debate between he and Maximus, and at the end of this debate, he's somehow convinced that, oh, he's been wrong this whole time, and Maximus is right, and I submit myself to the judgment of the faith, to the judgment of the church, and I'm going to go to Rome, and I'm going to speak with Pope Theodore, and I'm going to recant the ecthesis, my signature on that godforsaken document. And maybe, just maybe, when Gregory gets to Constantinople, he'll put me back in as patriarch. This must have been what he was thinking. But Pyrrhus's little plan starts to crumble. Just a couple of years later, in 647, Gregory is killed by some Muslim raiders. He was in a battle with them. He didn't make it. And Pyrrhus finds himself once more in court at Ravenna. This is in northern Italy. This would have been the... Uh, not not exactly the secondary capital, but this is sort of like the administrative HQ for the Byzantine Empire in the West. So here he is in Ravenna facing the emperor's new exarch. And um, about that, uh, what was your involvement with Gregory's rebellion? And did you go to Rome and tell the Pope that you didn't want to sign this document that you had already signed, that the emperor wants you to sign? And Pyrrhus is like, mm, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Anything that I've done, I repent of that. I recant my recantation, and I reinstate my monothelite leanings, and absolutely I sign on to the ecthesis of Sergius of Constantinople, of holy memory. So he recants with his, in, uh, his, his recantation. Gregory's dead. Doggone it. The plan didn't work. I guess I'm going to be in exile. And Pope Theodore, when he gets wind of this, he excommunicates him. And I've read, I hope this isn't true, but I've read that he did so with a pen dipped in in consecrated wine. Theodore spent a few years in communication with the new patriarch of Constantinople, Paul. This was the guy who was installed before Pyrrhus's official excommunication by Rome. Constans II had deposed him because of political what have you. He didn't like him, basically. Paul sent a profession of faith to Theodore, and he doesn't mention the ecthesis of Sergius, and he doesn't mention the question of one or two operations or wills in the person of Christ. However, in 648, Paul eventually outs himself as a monothelite heretic. And immediately, Theodore excommunicates him as well. In response, Paul put the imperial legate, excuse me, the papal legate under interdict. Meaning, you can't receive sacraments in this archdiocese. And in fact, anywhere the patriarch of Constantinople had jurisdiction, you would be under the, under the same interdict because all of his suffragan bishops surely would have done the same thing. Now this Paul, he also encourages Constantine the Fourth to retract the ecthesis formally and issue another edict. So they have a new edict, and this one is called the Typos. T-Y-P-O-S comes from another Greek word. The emperor wrote this one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The emperor wrote that he was dissatisfied with the divisions, the factions that were developing. You say one will in Christ. You say two wills in Christ. Why can't we all just get along? And he adds that all discussion should cease immediately. This is the emperor's edict called the Typos of 648. 
Furthermore, he states that everyone is to hold to the scriptures and the five holy councils and the fathers. This was in order to exclude personal views from creeping in. Now, what's the matter with personal views creeping into theology? What's, why not? Why can't we have a little fun? Well, how destructive can these things be? I'm quite sure, if you're watching this, you have experienced the damage that someone's private interpretation of Scripture or tradition or liturgy or maybe all of the above, the damage that this can, can, can wreak, the havoc, it's terrible. Personal opinions are secondary at the most. We, as Catholics, we fall back not on our opinion, but on what the church teaches. And thanks be to God, the emperor recognized that. He says, look, knowingly twisting documents, mm -mm, we're done with that. In fact, it's sinful to do that. If you know, well, this doesn't really mean that, but I'm going to kind of manipulate it to make it sound like it means that. When you do that, whether you're living in 648 or 1968 or 2022, that's a grave sin and scandal. And this is the kind of thing that leads little ones astray from the faith. And we know what happens to people who lead little ones astray from the faith. Something about a millstone and the sea. Well, in 648, the ecthesis of Sergius of Constantinople is formally suppressed, and the typos of Constantine IV is installed, promoted. It's the new official imperial policy. It's the law of the land. Everybody better be okay with it or else. Well, Pope Theodore, he died May 14th, 649, and he succeeded by a great and holy pope, Martin I. Martin immediately tackles the monothelite question and this new edict, the typos. Why? Why is he coming after the emperor's edict? It doesn't actually say anything mistaken, except that the emperor presumes to tell the church what to discuss or not discuss, which matters of doctrine to argue about, debate about, make judgments on, to define or not define. And this is ultra vires for the emperor. Spiritual matters Although they ought to concern him, they are none of his concern. He's not an ecclesiastic. So Martin kind of jumps on this typos. He holds a synod in Rome in the fall of 649. I believe it concludes in October. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure how long it runs, but it's done by the end of October. Over a hundred Western bishops are in attendance mostly Italians. St. Maximus was there as well. And this Roman Synod, uh, which was held in the Lateran uh, Basilica, so it's sometimes called the Lateran Synod of 649 or the, the Synod of Rome of 649. But it declared, among other things, that our Lord has two natural wills. And this was a direct affront to the imperial policy. Remember, we're not supposed to talk about it. We're not supposed to let bickering and factions get in the way of the peace of the empire. Well, what has typically happened in the past when popes directly irritate emperors? Hmm. Olympias, the new exarch, is instructed by the emperor to enforce the edict, enforce the typos. Oh, do you mean to say Martin and about a hundred other bishops are violating my order not to discuss the question of one or two wills? Well, Olympias, I'm ordering you now 
to march to Rome and enforce this law. So Olympias does. He marches from Ravenna to Rome, and his plans are to arrest Martin. However, he finds that the people of Rome are so devoted to the Holy Father that attacking the Pope, arresting him, doesn't really seem like a good idea. In Olympias' mind, this isn't possible. So he did what any of us would do. He changed sides. Instead of doing what the emperor wanted, he thought, well, I do have an army. Maybe I can make it to Constantinople. Maybe I can be emperor too. Or instead, I should say. But this didn't end well either. He was killed in Sicily as he began to make his way down uh, the Italian peninsula to get to a ship to take him to Constantinople. He's killed by Muslim raiders again. So Gregory tried it and he was killed. And now Olympias tried it and he's been killed. A new exarch. Right? The emperor finds out about it. He's like, oh, okay, here we go again. Well, let's get another man in there. This man's name is Theodore Calliopas. And he is very much set on enforcing the edict. He is very happy to execute the emperor's will. He marches to Rome and he finds Martin old and sick. That seems to be the perpetual condition of the popes, doesn't it? Old and sick. At least kind of old and kind of sick, if not always both. Anyway, he arrests Martin and he has him transported roughly, I may add, to Constantinople. However, before they left, Martin got Theodore to agree to let some of his entourage join him in Constantinople. They were going to accompany him on the journey. They want to make sure the Holy Father is comfortable and that his interests are provided for. I'm not exactly sure what they were expecting. Um, Theodore Calliopas, the exarch, he's okay with this. He says, well, all right, I guess we can have a few of your friends join us on the boat. That will be fine. And Martin says, whoever wants to volunteer, you're welcome to come with us. And if you don't, no hard feelings. I understand this is going to be a rough journey. We're not going to be treated well. I'm under arrest after all. Well, word spread. And the group of travelers grew so large that they wouldn't have fit on the ships. In fact, Theodore was concerned that if we let all these people join us, there are more of them than there are of us. They'll mutiny. They'll rebel. They'll take over the ships. They'll kill us all. So nobody gets to go. You blew it. Martin, you blew it. You said a couple people. Now you got like a ton of people that want to go. Now we got nobody. Martin was taken with no entourage on a ship to Constantinople. Upon his arrival, Pope Martin was ill with dysentery. This is in the, I, sh I should have mentioned the year. This is, I believe, around 653. Upon his arrival in Constantinople, he's ill. And instead of getting him ashore right away, taking him perhaps to a hospital or something similar, they just left him laying on the deck of the ship for about 24 hours, exposed to the elements, possibly up to three days out there, before finally being brought ashore. You can imagine the, the hecklers, the people that were jeering at him from the dock. Hmm. You dare defy the emperor? Look at you now. Hmm. Charges were eventually brought against him that were somewhat political in nature. Now, Martin, he kind of sees right through this whole thing. Nonetheless, he's charged with the following crimes. Conspiring with Olympias to an insurrection. Sending money to Arabs, 
and that he doesn't honor Mary as Theotokos. The last one is absolutely ridiculous. The first two are easily explainable. Martin didn't go along with the insurrection of Olympias, but he didn't stop him either. He's not a soldier after all. He doesn't work for the empire. This isn't my job. If he's going to take his army and march south, I live in Rome. My responsibilities are here. So the fact that I was on good terms with the guy that came to arrest me, but who changed his mind, doesn't mean I was aiding him in his insurrection. Okay, point number one taken care of. Point number three, so ridiculous, doesn't even need defense. Nobody, nobody believed that. What about sending money to Arabs? The Arabs are terrorizing the Eastern Roman Empire. They're taking territory left and right, and they're holding it too. Well, Martin was indeed sending money, but not to Arabs, to Christians living in Arab lands. This is like an ancient version of Peter's pence being used properly, sending money for the relief of Christians, for the edification and the upbuilding of the Christian communities for their support, for their food, clothing, whatever else they needed. So all three of these, easily explainable. But we know going in, Martin knew this, that these are trumped up charges. What I'm really here about is because I said there's two wills in Christ. The emperor says, don't talk about it. It was the will of the emperor that Martin be brought down. He believed that Martin's repudiation of his typos, his edict, was in fact a personal affront. Personal affront. His refusal to cease discussion on the monothelite question is obviously indicative of Martin's great disrespect for the person of the emperor. Now, he was clearly more concerned with avenging himself, what he perceived as personal insults, rather than upholding any sort of doctrinal orthodoxy. But Martin, again, he does what he can. It doesn't end well. During the trial, Martin sort of um, wryly comments that the prosecution should not have the witnesses testify under oath because they are so well prepared that for them to lie under oath would imperil their mortal souls. And if it pleases the court, would they be just allowed to testify not under oath so that when they tell their lies, they can repent of them later? In spite of all this, Martin was not able to participate very much at his trial. It was conducted in Greek. He only knew Latin. Well, he did know enough Greek to know what was going on, body language, and you can pick up a word here or there, but he was by no means fluent. And remember, he doesn't have his entourage. He doesn't have his advisors and his translators. When Martin begins his defense, he immediately goes to his condemnation of the typos and the heretical doctrine of one will or operation in the person of Christ. But he's immediately cut off. And at this time, he must have realized that there is no hope. There is no hope. These trumped up charges, they're, they're just a dog and pony show. I know why I'm here. They know why I'm here. Because when I bring it up, they won't let me talk about it. And just do with me what you will. He denies any involvement with Olympias. He denies sending money to Arabs. He denies, obviously, disrespecting the Virgin Mother of God. And he says, just whatever sentence you're going to have, just have it. Martin was sentenced to death. Now remember, he's old. And he's sick. And it's been made worse by his treatment by the imperial officials. 
roughly transported from Rome to Constantinople, left on the deck for a day or two or possibly three, he must have viewed his death sentence as a reprieve. Finally, an end to sufferings. Hmm. Not so fast. The sentence was commuted. Exile instead. Paul, the patriarch of Constantinople, probably intervened and put a bug in the ear of the emperor. Paul himself was sort of old and maybe a little bit of dying. And when the proceedings of the trial of Pope Martin were brought to him, or told to him, I should say, he was mortified. He says, yet another thing for me to atone for. Why would he say that? It's kind of strange. He really didn't have a hand in any of this. Well, it's my understanding that Paul knew that as the spiritual father of the people of Constantinople, in particular the emperor, that he's responsible for the decisions and the actions, at least to some degree, maybe not totally responsible. But he has some share in what his flock does, his spiritual children. So exile was suggested, and exile was carried out. Off went Martin to the Crimea. He was subject to further rough treatment, including near starvation. While in the Crimea, the people of Rome did something rather odd. In August of 654, they elected a new pope, Eugene. But Martin's still alive, and Martin hasn't resigned. Why would we do this? Three plausible explanations. Number one, perhaps the Romans doubted the validity of Martin's election. The reason for that would be because he wasn't confirmed by the emperor or the exarch in Ravenna. And that's what you did back then. The people didn't really know otherwise. Obviously, we don't expect that now, but they did at that time. And so because Martin's election was never imperially confirmed, was it valid? Was he actually the pope this whole time? Number two. Perhaps the Romans, finding out that he was exiled, maybe they thought he was already dead. Maybe they thought, well, surely Martin didn't survive the journey from Constantinople to the Crimea. And if he did, surely he didn't last long in the Crimea. After all, he was being treated very roughly, and he was old, and he was sick. Maybe... They thought he was dead, and they didn't realize, they they just didn't have any other choice. We need a pope. We need somebody to be the principle of unity, somebody to lead the Roman diocese, for that matter, in the city of Rome. This seems to me to be somewhat unlikely. Plausible, certainly possible. But what is a simple letter have confirmed for them whether or not Martin was still alive. You couldn't just write to someone, maybe locally. Have you seen Martin around? Hey, you know, the Pope, um, head of the Catholic Church. Yeah, that guy. Um, Is he still with us? That's why I think this option two is somewhat unlikely. Option three... Perhaps they felt the situation was hopeless. They knew Martin wasn't coming back. And again, they need a leader. They need a pope. We need a shepherd to guide the flock. What choice do we have? We have to do this. How long is he going to be gone? We don't know. When's he going to die? 
We don't know. When are we going to find out? How long will it take for news to get back? We don't know. So maybe we should just go ahead and, you know, sorry about that, Martin, but Eugene, would you like to be Pope? This could be. I think options one and three make the most sense. Whichever it is, and we may never know. Martin died on the 16th of September in the year 655. To this day, he is venerated as a martyr in the liturgy. Now, Pope Eugene, whether or not he was anti-Pope Eugene prior to the death of Martin, is a moot point because upon Martin's death, Eugene is the valid Pope. He's the legitimate successor of Peter. And he's a somewhat more congenial a man than Martin was. He sends legates back to Constantinople. He wants to reopen uh, lines of communication with the emperor. And there's a new patriarch, Peter. He wants to get on good terms with this guy. And he received, in fact, Peter's letter of election. Uh, this is that standard letter that the bishops would send to each other saying, hey, here's my profession of faith. This is what I believe. This is what I'm all about. Please confirm, by the way, I was elected and a duly appointed, blah, blah, blah. Well, Eugene receives the letter, meaning he accepted it. He said, okay, all right, Peter, Patriarch of Constantinople, fine. We'll be in communion with him. When he read it out, this, this profession of faith that Peter made, when he read it out before the people of Rome, they flat out rejected it. And they forced Eugene to refuse communion with him on the basis of Peter's being a monothelite. This was a known fact. Eugene was willing to kind of say, well, maybe it's not that big a deal. Maybe I should let this one slide. Ay, ay, ay. The emperor, undaunted, sends word, not to Eugene, but to Maximus, the confessor. He sends word to St. Maximus. The letter threatened he and Eugene. And why send it to Maximus in the first place? Well, I think the emperor knew that although Eugene is pope, it's Maximus who's the brainchild of the Orthodox party, right? He's the one who's kind of being the power behind this push for two wills or two operations, right? Constans doesn't see Eugene as the main target. He's a target, but we need Maximus. Here's what he says in his letter. Here's one line I picked out. Speaking to Maximus, know that when we get arrests from the heathen, Muslims, we will treat you like the Pope who is now lifted up, and we will roast all of you, each in his own place, as Martin has been roasted. What's he saying? It's obvious. Constance is threatening Maximus and Eugene with death or exile or perhaps both. But Eugene, lucky guy, he never had to deal with the wrath of the emperor. He died in June of 657 before Constance could really do anything about it. Maximus, however, was not so lucky. And we'll stop there. So where have we been? Well, we covered a much narrower time frame than usual. We went from 641 to 657, 16 years. We're leading up to Constantinople III. We're engaged in the monothelite heresy. That's that there is one will or one operation in Christ. And our hero, well, we've got a couple of heroes. Martin's a hero. Theodore was a hero. Eugene, eh, kind of. But Maximus, he's our man. Next time, next week, part 14 of this series on the ecumenical councils, we're going to look at what happened to Maximus. 
how did it go? And we're going to inch closer to Constantinople III, which took place in the years 680 and 681. All right. As I sip my contramundum in honor of St. Athanasius, in celebration of my son's birthday, I have to remind myself, I have to remind you all to never give up, to keep on smiling, and to memento mori. God bless you.